Hi, I'm Carrie Sharp. I'm the owner of RD Bootcamp. I'm also the owner of a private practice called Sharp Nutrition, where I provide nutrition counseling. So I'm going to talk to you about what that means. So counseling versus educating, that is super important to know when to use this when you're talking with your patients. So I kind of split them up. Counseling is more like the asking. We're asking our patients questions. And educating is more when we need to tell them things. So it's asking versus telling. And I like the pictures because the one is the smiley face with the thoughts and feelings and the educating is the teacher in the classroom. So when we're counseling a patient, we're asking them, we're trying to learn the why of things, learning the thoughts and feelings to help motivate the patient to want to change. So for example, asking the patient, why do you think you were snacking a lot in the evenings? And then telling teaching a topic the patient doesn't know. So for example, maybe they come in and they've um, been diagnosed with elevated cholesterol. Well, maybe you need to tell them what foods contain cholesterol so they can then start making changes in their diet. So in the counseling approach, we use a lot of motivational interviewing. I also use some cognitive behavioral therapy, but motivational interviewing is the big one. It's uh, rule, or, rule, ORs, and SMART goals. So rule and ORs kind of go hand in hand when you're counseling a patient. And then at the end, always, I always, always, always set SMART goals. So rule is resist the writing reflex. So it's important not to correct our patients, help them come to the information on their own, understand your client's motivations. The most important one, I think, is active listening. That is the biggest one. When I have interns in my private practice, we practice active listening, picking up on the patient's cues. So for example, we have the patient who was diagnosed with elevated cholesterol. They come in, but they were also diagnosed, for example, with uh, type 2 diabetes. So they come in and they say, hey, I want to, you know, learn to change my diet, but you know what? I'm on this great cholesterol medication, so I'm all good there. So teaching the patient about changing their cholesterol and their diet, changing the food that contain cholesterols or teaching them the f what the food is, it's probably not going to be the best solution. We got to figure out what's important to them because then they will motivate to change. They will empower themselves to make the changes in their diet. Ors is what we use kind of throughout the rule. So you're talking to the patient and you might ask open-ended questions. You might use affirmations, reflective listening, summarizations of conversations. So we use them kind of hand in hand when we're counseling our patients. Then at the end, we set a SMART goal. And a SMART goal, uh, all right. So at the end of every session, I usually say to the patient, Based on our conversation today, what SMART goal would you like to make? And my patients that are regulars, they're all like, oh, it's time for goals. <laughs> um, so if you tell them what their goal is, like maybe that patient, you say, well, hey, I think you need to only eat meat once a day. Well, your patient, one, wasn't even focused on cholesterol. And two, that's not their goal. That's your goal. You've decided that. So you flip it around. Hey, based on what we talked about today, what is your SMART goal? So if they make their own SMART goal, they are more likely to actually do the goal. <laughs> It'll be achievable. And they'll come back feeling motivated to make little, little small changes each time they come back. So another factor is health at every size. So this concept is out there, but what does it really mean for a dietitian? What does it mean for us when we are counseling our patients? Um, so we have a patient come in, we pay less attention to weight. That is more attention to overall health and avoid being judgmental. That's huge. I, that's one of the big things I teach. Walk in with a clean slate, don't be judgmental, and learn. Listen and learn from your patient. Try and understand where they're coming from. So I have a case study. It's uh, not based on one real patient, but a combination of, of many of my patients. OK, 
Okay, here we go. All right, so our female is age 46 and she's been diagnosed with prediabetes, elevated cholesterol, Hashimoto's, which is uh, hypothyroidism, fibromyalgia, obesity class two, PTSD from adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. All right. So in the clinical side, we've got our clinical diagnoses. We've got anthropometrics and labs. So we're going to look at them. So she's 62 inches, not a very tall person. That's 5'2", 208 pounds with a BMI of 38. So obese class 2. Her A1C is 6.3% and she's got elevated triglycerides and cholesterol. So... PTSD from ACEs um, means that, well, we'll just say in a session, she probably kind of came out and said, hey, this is what happened in my childhood, and it's caused me to have PTSD. ACEs is actual um, diagnosis now. So she's got some history, and maybe that's tied to why she has a, a, a relationship with food that she's struggling with. Okay, so now this is where the counseling comes in. So that was more the clinical side. We've got our numbers. And the counseling side, we start with what is our patient's well-being? Well, the patient came in and she's like, the doctor told me that the only solution was to, to lose weight and put me on medications. Well, she felt unheard. No, that's not the only solution. There's many, many other solutions. So we're here to help with the patient's well-being along with nutrition. She was depressed, stressed, personally insecure about herself, and felt her eating was very uncontrolled. She was on a carb-heavy diet, eating large portions, emotional eating, eating sweets often, and binge eating. So we're going to walk through in a dime like how I do a counseling session to this patient. So this is my patient, and we're in session. All right, so first I would do an assessment. Um, we would definitely take the clinical side. It's just as important. We want to know weight history, food allergies, again, the diagnosis, you know, um, needs, even like how often do they get fast food? What is their lifestyle? Then nutrition counseling is how, why <laughs> really, really get into the feelings. Why? How do you feel? What happened in the past? Uh, when I do a dietary recall, I usually don't have them write it down. I usually, it's a conversation and I'll say, Hey, um, you know, walk me through a typical day. And I'll even say, when do you exercise? Tell me when, when are you sleeping? What are you drinking throughout the day? And they'll really walk me through their day and they integrate feelings like throughout too. And then I ask, like, have they tried diets in the past? What worked? What didn't work? Because they tell you about their experiences before you tell them any changes or even recommend any changes because they might have already done that. Most important is, again, active listening. Throughout this assessment, I am learning about my patient. All right. So I've done an assessment and then we have a diagnosis. So that's where our PES statements come into play. We have our medical diagnosis. Now, a clinical diagnosis could be the obesity related to food and nutrition knowledge deficit as evidenced by a BMI of 38. But we're considering health at every size. So health at every size, we're going to flip it. I might still put that as a PES statement because, you know, it's, it's still a number that we're going to keep an eye on. But most likely, I'm going to focus on the A1C and the elevated cholesterol and triglycerides. So for example, I might do a PS statement, excessive carbohydrate intake related to psychological causes, which is her depression, anxiety. Maybe we had a conversation and she said, I get depressed at night and it's causing me to binge at night or something as evidenced by A1C of 6.3. So that is more where we're focusing when we're doing health at every size. All right, so the intervention, so a clinical intervention is very typical. Here's your medication, supplements, whatever. You need to lose weight. Here's portion control. Oh, here's a diet. Go on the Mediterranean diet. Well, we all know that these kind of 
sometimes work, sometimes don't work, depending on how the approach is. Nutrition counseling is, is what we do as dietitians. It's intertwined with the assessment. So when I'm assessing my patient and taking the assessment in, I'm also doing the counseling and the intervention at the same time. Uh, we might talk about strategies to redirect away from food when feeling emotional. We might even talk about like a balanced plate method, how to, how to use your hands as portion control methods. We're definitely going to talk about no good or bad foods and help reduce the feeling of guilt around food. So I try and take away that, that foods have good or bad or healthy versus unhealthy. We really, really talk about um, that all foods have value, but in moderation. And how are we going to balance it? Uh, with kids, I use the color wheel. It's really fun. And we always, always, always set SMART goals. Sometimes my patients come back and say, oh, I didn't do that goal. Sometimes they come back and, and exceed the goal and did three other goals that we didn't even talk about. But it's okay because that's the, that's the process. Then my scope of practice or our scope of practice as dietitians in nutrition counseling ends at a certain point where it is, we have to know it's out of our scope and we will recommend a therapist to help deal with emotions, trauma, et cetera. So we're going to talk about, for example, strategies to redirect away from food when feeling emotional, but we're not going to talk about them to them about what happened in their past or, you know, what happened in their childhood that's causing them to have the strategies to that's, that's not, that's out of our scope of practice. So that's where we recommend therapists and we do continuity of care. Okay, so monitoring and evaluation is where we follow along the clinical side. We've got our measurements, we've got cal calculations, the labs, the diagnosis and um, needs, general needs. But in our counseling, we're really following up on the goals, are they making small changes over time? Are they making lifestyle changes? Is their dietary recall, every time that you assess their dietary recall, have you noticed that they've incorporated some of their changes into it? Are these lifestyle changes sticking? And active listening, I'm going to constantly say that because if you're not listening to your patient and you're in that telling mode, then you've lost them. So keep listening, keep listening, pick up on their cues and follow them through their journey, not what you think is best for them. Okay, so now after, let's say, 15 sessions, we're going to say maybe it was six months or whatever, uh, for example, we've resolved prediabetes, elevated cholesterol and triglycerides, triglycerides and fibromyalgia. All of that's gone away. Look at this. Her A1C is normal. Her triglycerides and cholesterols are in the normal range. She's doing great. Her BMI dropped a, day, a little bit, but she's still class two. But she is feeling great. So this is where patients' well-being again. So we've got clinical numbers. She is in the healthy range. She will always have Hashimoto's, obesity, class two is something that maybe when we're ready, we will address. And PTSD from ACEs is something she will deal with her therapist with. So now we've got a patient who we've proven that it's not true that her only solution is to lose weight. And I'm going to tell you this, doctors, there's a lot of great doctors out there. I'm not saying doctors are bad, okay? I love a lot of the doctors that I work with. So um, this was really just a random case study scenario. Um, but she felt heard. So she came in, we listened, we made small changes over time. Her A1C and cholesterol went down and she felt listened to and heard through our counseling, our nutrition counseling. She was overall happier, healthier, less stressed, more confident in herself. She felt empowered and her eating was more controlled. She started limiting her carb intake, focusing on portion control, redirecting herself away from food when emotional, eating only just a little bit of sweets. She stopped binging completely. 
She's exercising and now eating a more balanced diet. See, so much has changed in her well-being that it didn't even fit in that circle. <laughs> so we now have an empowered patient who still has an obesity BMI, but she is in the healthy zone. So health at every size. Her labs are all normal. So if she chooses to go on a weight loss path, now she's in a more positive state to do it. If she chooses not to, that's okay too. Her labs are normalized and she's feeling good. So I love this picture. This is not my patient. This is not this patient. This is not even a real patient. It's a stock photo. Just have to throw that out there. But to me, I see that picture and I'm like, wow, she is happy and she is empowered. And that is the patient we want to see in the end. All right. So thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. You can go to either or one of my websites, um, rdbootcamp.com or sharpnutrition.net. Thank you.